Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sophia, and I run events here at The Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of Elizabeth Knox's newest book, The Absolute Book, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until, after 93 years, The Strand is the sole survivor, now run by third generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for all your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers and authors, we wouldn't be here today. Tonight, we are thrilled to have with us Elizabeth Knox for the launch of her newest book, The Absolute Book. Elizabeth Knox is the author of 17 books, including the award-winning novels, The Vintner's Luck, Dream Hunter, and Dreamquake, which received awards from the ALA, CCBC, Booklist, and the New York Public Library. An Arts Foundation laureate, an officer of the New Zealand Order of Merit, and the recipient of the Prime Minister's Award for Fiction, she lives in Wellington, New Zealand, where she teaches a course on world building at Victoria University. Joining Elizabeth in conversation is Dan Coyce. Dan is a writer at Slate. He is the author of How to Be a Family, The Year I Dragged My Children Around the World to Find a New Way to Be Together, and the co-author of The World Only Spins Forward, An Ascent of Angels in America. Dan's newest novel, Vintage Contemporaries, will be published by Harper in 2022. He, leave, he lives in Arlington, Virginia. So without further ado, please welcome Elizabeth Knox and Dan Coyce to the stage. Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Elizabeth Knox. We can hear you <laughs> clapping from here on the internet. Uh, I'm so delighted to be here for uh, a historical book event. Never in publishing history has there been a greater disparity in quality of hair between interviewer and interviewee. Uh, Elizabeth, you look majestic. Thank you for joining us. Hello from New Zealand. Thank you. Thank you. You look majestic too. <laughs> I appreciate uh, you saying that. So first of all, uh, let's wow all the American viewers here with a simple fact. What day and time is it where you are? It is more or less one o'clock and it is a Thursday. Thursday. It's like a magic trick every time. So we're all stuck in Wednesday back here. So we're all yep. dying to know how is Thursday? Are things just like better in general? Thursday is windy and sunny. Yes. And so things no, always a normal are Wellington better. summer day. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm so pleased to be talking with you about the absolute book, a uh, book I absolutely love. I'm so delighted to see it in this American edition. Um, so let's kick it off. You have said in an interview with, uh, with a wonderful New Zealand writer, Pip Adam, uh, that ran on the Pantograph Punch, that when you were writing this book, you were writing your way into happiness. Um, what did you mean by that? And how, how does that manifest in the book itself? Well, um, we'd had some very difficult years because my mother had had ALS and I was looking after her and then my brother-in-law was killed in pretty much the same way that the, the sister of the heroine of the absolute book, Taryn, her sister Beatrice is killed. And in other words, run down on purpose by a stranger with a motor vehicle. Um, so I, these difficult years had demanded a lot from us and while they were heartening and that a lot of people around us behaved wonderfully, you know, and, and we managed to acquit ourselves well. And you have that great feeling when you're finally able to walk away from all the strictures of responsibility and you realize that you haven't, you are walking away because it's over. You haven't run away because it's scared. And um, so you kind of put yourself back together again partly with more confidence in yourself, but also more confidence in the possibilities of people being, doing the sensible thing and the right thing in the world. So I kind of had that feeling and I wanted to do something with it. And then I, and I wanted to write a big book, a big book that had a lot of the things that I'm just fascinated in and also had a sense of the scale of the world. And because I write fantasy, my sense of the scale of human life is always going to be expressed with a bunch of inhumans too. But then I was also wanted to be writing about 
um, you know, that, that, that we don't live in a human world. We live in a, a world that has every other creature and plant and so forth in it. And just to get that sort of sense of, sense of um, everything possibly being able to work together. So, um, so yeah, so I, I, I started this book, but I needed a way to start it. So I had been thinking about the kind of books that I love where you have a scholarly hero looking for something, uh, the sort of the Dan Brown um, Da Vinci Code book or the Kate Moss Labyr Labyrinth book or, um, oh, there's, there's, dozens, there's a fabulous book called Dictionary of the Khazars and I've forgotten the author, but it was published in the early 90s and it is about a, a magical cursed book that people are looking for. So I kind of wanted that vibe but I wanted it to not just be a sort of a scholarly thriller, you know, a, a thriller with a scholarly hero, but also to turn out to be a fantasy book and then to keep opening up into bigger worlds. Uh, Milorad Pavic is the author of Dictionary. That's Dictionary. it, I, yes. I remember that novel from the early 90s um, and finding it daunting at the time. Um, so I love the idea of, of the the sort of possibilities being what was driving the different worlds you were exploring uh, in this, the idea that so many things are possible and you wanted a book to, that tried to touch on all of those things. Um, and, and I will say that from my perspective, I just generally tend to think of Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code uh, as like a little bit hacky and as books that sort of like narrow possibilities. Um, but you are a genuine fan of these books and of the job they do for a reader. What is it that you love so much about them? And then um, what are some of the ways that you try to turn that a little bit for your purposes for this book? Well, I think the thing that I love about those books is that they evoke a sense of mystery. You know, the, the pursuit of a mystery um, just has a feeling of mystery in itself. Uh, and because they're often thrillers, they offer the possibility for, for suspense too. Now, one reason that the Dan Brown books are good uh, for many readers, that they appeal to a large audience, is because they, they kind of have scholarship in them, but they kind of, uh, they sort of flatter the intelligence of the reader um, by, by um, you know, kind of, telling them things in a way that's gradual enough for them to go, oh, with the sense of discovery. Um, I I really admired the, the Da Vinci Code, but I did find it a little bit frustrating that I kept guessing the, the puzzle, like <laughs> <laughs> however many pages beforehand going, oh, yes, that's right, Alexander Pope. Right, like how much <laughs> of a genius can the guy be if, like, I'm figuring it out before he does? <laughs> yeah, but... Um, I, I just think that there's that whole thing where, you know, you, you have characters that are geniuses for the purpose of fiction or, or you know, or they're, or they're, and then, and then it's the act of persuasion. It's like, we, we believe in Reacher. We believe that Reacher can, can, you know, bash eight eight heavies heads together with his principle of only ever you only ever have to fight one guy, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, that I've, I, I love that this, answered your question. <laughs> no, no, but I love this notion of the of uh, of thinking about why it is that people love these books and why they make them feel smart. And your book, I could never guess what was what the answer to the puzzle was before it arrived. And I also got the impression that we're meant to understand that Taryn and Jacob and the other people in this book while being very smart people are not in any way superhuman or even particularly necessarily exceptional in their intelligence, that they, like us, are baffled quite a bit of the time uh, and, then, uh, and then feel wonder at the things that they are presented, the same kind of wonder that we feel. And I like the idea that you're, you're challenging our intelligence the same way that your story is challenging the intelligence of its heroes and heroines. Uh, and that seems to me to be a very tricky thing 
to pull off. And so I guess the question here is, how are you challenging yourself in coming up with, you know, the next level of magic and the next level of world building as you are working your way through this novel? Were you finding that these things were coming to you easily or that you were really struggling to figure out, well, what is the next place or the next exceptional thing that's going to happen to these people? I had a kind of a uh, things that I knew the book had to do and I had an idea very early on of the kind of tone I wanted it to take and I think tone runs books and I wanted a mixed tone like one of my favorite books um Mikhail Bulgakov's The Master of Margarita which is a book which has a book in it you know a book that's very a manuscript that's very nearly burned and a manuscript that gets the attention of the devil um, so that book's kind of behind the absolute book uh, in terms of it giving me permission to to make a, a very real so, social situation and then plonk you know the the devil into it or and 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 a big and talk a talking cat kind of scenario, which is what's going on in the Master and Margarita. But what was running me was its mixed tone that that it has. It has things in it that are farcical. It has things that are grand and and beautiful and incredibly funny to the point of silliness. And it it manages all that. So that was one thing. What I was thinking of was was um, trying to trying to not not just run the whole thing on a single sort of aesthetic which gives you a lot more possibility when it comes to plot too, if you don't do that. Um, you can open things up. The other thing was I wanted there to be competing interests in the book and for them all to be equivalent. Not equivalent in terms of what the reader's interested in the story, but but um, that the demons in the story are not bad. They behave very badly, but they've got a reason for their what they want and I wanted everybody in the book to have an argument for what they were going to want out of what the what you know the thing they were pursuing the the object that everyone's pursuing they all have a good reason to get it it's not and just they all have an equal claim on power. it. yeah no that's right they 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 have a they have a you know, they when the demons want sovereignty. So there's 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 a whole kind of um, uh, my guiding light was um, Hi, um, Miyazaki Hayao's Princess Mononoke, which is a book where absolute. I mean, that, which is a film where absolutely every every competing interest in that has a case to put. You know, they they end up fighting with each other but they all have an equal claim to justice and to resources. And and that was kind of like very much part of what was going on in the book. As for the way I just came up with the next thing, some of the next things are dictated by the necessities of the story. Like I knew I had to go to purgatory because, because I had a very strong idea of what purgatory would be like. You know what? What a good what a good purgatory will be like, and that that would carry a, would would be a place to put a whole lot of the feelings in the book about being able to get better, being able to to change your life. In this case, change the meaning of your life, even from the afterlife. Um, and some of it is just you get your characters into a situation and it's like the old radio serials where the drunken writer, you know, the famously the drunken writer is is unable to turn in the script at the end at the end of the serial and they finally get him on the line so that the next night they can when he's on a bender so so he can get his characters out of this terrible situation and then you know he just turns in one line that says and with a mighty heave he was free <laughs> so the, the point the point the my my whole thriller real thriller chapter um where the characters are um in a dreadfully dangerous situation and chained to a tractor tire in a inlet with the tide coming in um they get themselves out of that but they're still in danger like it's one of those is supposed to behave like a, the end of a film where Car carrie's hand leaps out except you know it's it's the naturalistic threat that keeps coming back 
um, of the, of the person, the malicious person. And um, my way of getting them out of that was, you know, it is, is the, one of the big surprises of the book. It's I like what I won't give it away hell? here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, but that's a great example. Of, that's a great example of the way that leaving yourself open to possibility can create a scene that's doing a bunch of different things at one time. That's I mean, I have a whole note about that scene, which is of all the scenes in the book is the one that has most lodged in my mind in the year since I first read it. And it's not particularly fantastical at all. As you say, it's just our two heroes chained to a tire by a bad guy. The tire is huge and they can't lift it. And so they just have to very painstakingly before the tide comes in, push the tire up the beach so they can get onto land. Um, but then, as you say, there's this totally different way that the that the scene ends, a totally unexpected way, and um, and I found that scene just remarkable in its combination of the the very detailed writing behind the the physical things they have to do to solve problem A, and then the shock and surprise behind the the other thing that happens to solve problem B, and um, and and that really encapsulates to me the fun of this book, this ability to be working in both those modes at once. Um, yeah, it so doesn't use ma it doesn't use magic lightly. Like, right. it, it, like it's, it's, it has this, you know, there's magic there. Um, you don't see it. And it's like many, it's like the, you know, the, all the hidden things in the book, because it's stored power, you know? <laughs> so then you suddenly kind of, when it, when it does turn up, it's like, whoa. Yeah, it's big. It's <laughs> big, big shock. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you've got an epigraph uh, in this book from Patricia Lockwood, um, the poet and memoirist and now novelist. She has a new novel out next week in the United States. I expect it has not made its way to New Zealand yet. Yes, I'm very, very excited. I, I yeah, I worship Patricia Lockwood. <laughs> um, so the book, the the book is called um, "No One Is Talking About This," and uh, the sort of operating metaphor of the book uh, is of the internet as a portal. Um, she just, she uses the word, the portal to describe the internet and her inner, the main characters interactions with it, uh, are physical in a way. And, and I find it fascinating in, in that book that it recognizes that the internet is not just something you look at on your phone, but it's a door to a different place. She describes it as a, a slippery place, uh, like smooth with lube, uh, but it has totally different <laughs> rules. And it really reminded me, reading it the other week, of the the portal reminded me of the gates that Shift opens with his gauntlet in this book, The Gates to Other Worlds. Um, and so I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about your relationship to the internet. Do you find that there's something otherworldly about the internet, that something about the internet draws you in and takes you to a different place? Or do you have a healthy relationship to the internet? Oh, no, I do. I do actually spend far too much time on Twitter, but um, partly I'm going to blame it on um, the New Zealand Twitterverse, which is it's got it's, it's got some sort of madly arm waving maniacs on it, like you know, like Twitter has everywhere. But it's it's got a lot of very fine and very amusing people. So it's very charming, kind, the New Zealand Twitterverse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm kind I'm kind of addicted to New Zealand Twitter, and and then I have a lot of really interesting other non-New Zealand Twitter friends. So yeah, for me, for me, the two beautiful things that the internet has done is put a lot of movies and television at my fingertips. Um, and that's for a long time. So since I love television and movies, this is this has just been a blessing. And the other thing was that you know, probably one of the most important people in my life is my younger sister, with whom I've been playing an imaginary game for years and years and years and years, like, you know, decades. And we were able to pick that up again as soon as we had the Skype and could could do, in effect, what we were doing when we were growing up, which was lying in a darkened room together telling each other a story, except the darkened rooms we're lying in, one of them's in the Blue Mountains in Australia and the other one's in Wellington, New Zealand. It's a very peculiar pursuit, but we've been pursuing it, you know, <laughs> for a long time. Uh, boy, and it's uh, pretty much where my fiction comes from. I really love that. Uh, what a great relationship and a great way to maintain it. Um, 
I want to go back to something you were talking about early in this conversation about this, um, about one of the things that spurred this book, the, the, um, the death of your brother-in-law. Is that correct? Yes. Brother-in-law. Um, in a, in a situation very much like the death of Taryn's sister in this book, um, the, the sort of chief plot driver and, um, and the chief sort of moral issue of the book, at least the first half of the book, is this question of what happens after an event like that happens and what happens when a person chooses the revenge that everyone sort of fantasizes about in a situation like that. But is but when someone is given the opportunity to pursue that revenge and takes it, Taryn, it's not really spoiling anything to say that um, Taryn... Uh, finds herself with an opportunity to take revenge upon the person who did this to her sister. And she, uh, she does it. She does it a little bit lightly without really thinking about the ramifications. Um, what made you interested in having a character do this thing? Uh, was it simply that it was something that you and your family could not do? Uh, is it something that you have ever flirted with in your life? Not necessarily in this situation, but in any situation. And and what was it like exploring that through this alternate person? Well, that's a, that's a whole variety of questions. For a start, I'll tackle the whether or not I've ever thought of the revenge. Um, I don't know that I would have been thinking of it as revenge at this point, but there was a man many years ago who did something terrible to that very younger sister that I'm thinking about and I used to pass him walking up towards our house when I was uh, in my late teens in my young adulthood because he was a neighbor and he was always smirk knowing me knowingly at me and this was back in the days when men got away with those things and even more we than they all... do now yes that's right yeah. and then um, we were always walking beside a path that had a long fall through through kind of like bushes and things down to the beach houses on the beach in Ivy's Bay. And I would pass him, and if there was no one there, no traffic and no people, which there often was because it was a, quite a while ago and, you know, there were fewer people in the world, I would want to push him. And I could not push him despite knowing, really firmly knowing that he deserved it <laughs> because of just simple pity for the human body. So I know that I know that I, that at that point, very young and quite morally unformed, I was actually incapable of taking, you know, acting in a vengeful manner when I felt I had every reason for revenge and also I was really just furiously angry. But, yep. That was interesting. It was an interesting thing to discover about yourself. Um, as for, I we, it wouldn't have crossed my mind the the whole idea of revenge about my brother in law because it it was a terrible thing that the man who killed him did, but he did it so spitefully and so carelessly, and he did get sent to prison and. Then actually, it's actually better for everybody if then the rest of his life, his fate, then becomes none of your business because because Duncan left behind a wife and four children and it's been particularly the four children that needed our kind of attention and input. Yeah. Pity for the human yes. body is such a, a, a is such a, an accurate and wonderful and difficult way to put it. And... I do think that 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 is a, a thing that holds us back in ways that we don't understand until we're faced with moments like this. Just the foreknowledge of what the results of what you might do would look like uh, and the way they would be seared on you in a way. And, and I, I, you know, with Taryn, she doesn't have to deal with that. She is, finds a way to put herself at a remove from what it is she hopes will happen. Yes, and that's the thing, that's her sin, really. I mean, mm -hmm. taking the revenge is one thing, but getting, persuading someone else who's kind of enchanted with things about her, but also with the idea of kind of, you know, making a big difference to her life, like kind of the story of it, enchanted with the story 
the story they're telling themselves about what they can do for her, then they go and accomplish the revenge and it twists their life out of shape, though you never really see exactly what's happened to that person. And Taryn's gradual realisation of what she's done kind of makes her not live her life. Like It's like she's she's kind of put herself in and she has a professional life, but her, but her personal life is a as a leafless tree. And I wanted to tell that story partly because I felt that I understood the urge for revenge and I understood the calamity of having the urge for revenge and then doing something about it. But So I felt equal to telling it. But mostly I, I wanted to tell a certain kind of recovery narrative. I wanted Taryn to not just be grieving, but to also to kind of sabotage her whole relationship to herself. Um, by doing this terrible thing and then to come slowly back to life because, the I mean, the book is, a, you know, an arcane thriller, you know, the scholarly hero thing, thriller story, and it's a fantasy novel, but it is also a recovery narrative. I just want to remind all our uh, viewers that we are hungry for your questions and we'll be ask, answering them at the end of this conversation. So please use the little ask a question button to ask Elizabeth questions. We want to hear from you. Otherwise, the last 10 minutes of this are just going to be us staring at you and everyone feeling uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> I spent a lot of the time I was reading this book um, thinking about Ursula Le Guin, not just the storytelling which is, you know, fluid and fluent and 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 grabby, but also there's a very clear moral intellect behind the story that you're telling, and it's reflected in some ways in, in what we've just talked about with Taryn's relationship with revenge. But all throughout, I just really got the sense that the that you, the author, and the book itself are were always concerned with trying to ferret out the the greater meaning of your characters actions and i really love that about the book and and i i think i think i know that you're a Le Guin fan um and so i just want to ask you what's your uh favorite Le Guin? oh hell spells ah, <laughs> toughest question yet yeah no that, that that is really tough god probably the dispossessed which is kind of a difficult and angular book in some ways because mm -hmm. it's so Harsh. I've had a lot of trouble with that book, I will say. Yeah, but um, I loved it when I read it when I was 16, and then I re I didn't reread it again until about two years ago, and then I reread it, and I loved it even more. But, I mean, honestly, I just everything of Le Guin's is, is a marvel, and, and the Earthsea, the five books of the Earthsea trilogy are five, six. <laughs> yeah. Also, what's wonderful about them is is the characters getting older, and that they never cease their emotional lives of the older characters and the way they relate to the world and their feelings of responsibility towards things and their tenderness towards growing tenderness towards the natural world is so beautifully done. You know, like. She, the, Le Guin's recording her own um, sort of jumps in her own age uh, from like the young woman tenor to the, to the yeah. woman in her 40s who finds love again to, to, to the old lady looking after the old man at the very end. It's like, oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah. Um, one of the hearts of this book is uh, Taryn's study of libraries and her love of libraries. I'm curious, do you have a beloved library that's your, that you feel is your library? <laughs> yeah, well, um, I would have if we had it, but the Wellington Library is closed oh, yeah. because of the Kaikoura earthquake. And yeah. I mean, you know, Wellington at the moment is in a parlous state. Like everyone's kind of up in arms about the fact that our water pipes are bursting and our sewers co are collapsing and everything. But it's all it's all years of neglect on top of the Kaikoura earthquake, which made incalculable damage. You know, it's just no Despite library. being not really that huge of an earthquake by possible Wellington was, earthquake standards. Well, yeah, but it was a it was huge elsewhere. So I mean, if you fly down the 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 um, east coast of the South Island, you just see all these kind of scarred hillsides, which are vast landslips. 
So it, it really was huge. But, but here it came as slow waves, but the slow waves are very bad for the sewer pipes, I believe. No, the Wellington it Library actually, is... It actually just went... It undulated really yeah. slowly but powerfully. It's quite something. <laughs> uh, I only experienced very tiny earthquakes when I was in Wellington, and boy, am I glad I was not there for that one. Um, <laughs> the Wellington Library is a beautiful space. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so is that a place where you... What is it about that library that has moved you over the years and that you're eager to return to? Well, I'm a very bad library user because I like to go into libraries and nose at things, but I'm I'm a terrible accumulator of library finds. Um, also, my husband basically is developing his own private library gradually over the years, you know. I see it behind you. <laughs> No, I think those are just the CDs, but I mean, really, we've got thousands of books. So there's no point in me going to the library, except it's another place I like to go to be in the presence of the books. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, I love being, I love being in the presence of people, being in the presence of books too. There is something very magical about seeing someone discover something uh, and knowing in your head exactly what it's going to do to them when they like make their way two thirds of the way through it. I feel that way when I see someone reading something on the subway and I always have to physically stop myself from being like, Oh, did you get to the part where? <laughs> yes. 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 Um, so the husband you briefly mentioned, um, is, uh, in addition to a budding librarian is the head <laughs> of Victoria university press, your publisher in Wellington. Yes. You two are, are, I hate to tell you something of a New Zealand literary power couple, <laughs> um, do you talk to each other about what you're reading and do you have any big disagreements about books or is your taste, what's the Venn diagram of your opposing tastes like? How much do they overlap? Um, there are books that he doesn't read that I do read, but he would like them if he did read them because whenever <laughs> I'm able to persuade him to read one, he does like them. So, so you're the evangelist. He, yeah, well, yeah. no, I'm not. No, no, no. And he isn't either because it's never worked. But he does put books in front of me and say, you'll like this one. So he's like my taster, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of, I'm the aristocrat. He's my taster. <laughs> Make sure I'm not poisoned by, you know, ennui, by re ennui. Yeah, ennui by reading reading something that isn't quite good enough for me. But, but my tastes and his are both very wide. So, yeah. So, but but I do have a tendency to sort of occasionally go oh gosh there's another Georgette Hire I haven't read or something like that well he's never going to do that uh, I was thrilled to hear you mention Miyazaki and Princess Mononoke is that your favorite Miyazaki my favorite Miyazaki is Kiki's Delivery Service probably but it's really hard to pick a favorite for him too I mean he's he's just transcendent just a beautiful character and the way he saw the world, the way he makes us see it, mm -hmm. which is what animation can do. Um, I mean, all directors can point their camera and show you something wonderful and linger on it and, and you make you see something. But when somebody's actually in charge of the whole reality of it, like. Right. They they're not only the pointing animation. the camera, but they are the thing. Yeah. They're the thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you, have you watched Goro's um, Earthsea movie? Is it, I have never watched it. I've been afraid to. Uh, yes, and it has some really good things in it. But um, yeah, it's, it, it's he's basically doing uh, just the, uh, the you know the nineteen eighties one. My brain's going to not work. The one, the girl was a dragon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one. <laughs> uh, I'm here to tell you Ten. that. It's, oh, I've forgotten. I can't remember either. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that if um, you have not yet watched the new Studio Ghibli movie that Goro directed that's CGI, let me urge you in the strongest possible terms to not watch it. Okay. It's bad news. Um, yes, and we have Pixar. Yes, exactly. We're, we want to watch a great CGI movie with heart. We've got Pixar for that. Let's. I'll just hold out for the what seems to maybe be the final Miyazaki, Hayao Miyazaki movie coming out in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Um. So it was a, a real pleasure for me to write a piece that helped to get this particular book an American deal. Um, and now I want to offer you the floor. Let's assume that a couple of dozen American book editors are watching this conversation right now. What is the New Zealand book 
or a New Zealand book, not necessarily the, what is a New Zealand book that you simply cannot believe that some American publisher has not picked up and published and gotten rich off of? Okay, so I'm just going to say the last two novels by the aforementioned Pip Adam. Mm -hmm. So um, both The New Animals and Nothing to See. And um, Nothing to See is a masterpiece. I'm going to get Her it mind is, Yeah, go, go get it. Go wave it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Pip Adam's Nothing to See, um, which is an extraordinary book uh, about – Precarious lives, but about a small group of young women in an unnamed New Zealand city who at some point in their lives, they something terrible happened to them and they woke up and there were two of them instead of one of them. They had the same person, but there's two of them. And the book proceeds from there. Yeah. And, and it's a thing that has struck other women uh, in this in this world. In this, yes, all, in this. all women who have yeah. turned into some two and then people don't really look at them after that they don't deal with them as two people they don't really look at them there's just nothing to see yeah well i'm delighted um, that you are joining my crusade to get some american publisher to publish pip adam because good lord is that book incredible um good job i appreciate it uh so it's been quite some time now since you finished the absolute book um, it was published in New Zealand in 2018, I think. Is that right? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, end of 2019. End of 2019. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, and then you did some revisions for this American edition. Um, I'm curious, is there a new thing you're working on now? I am finishing a number of books. So uh, the one that's closest <laughs> is... Putting the rest of to shame, Elizabeth. I know it's terrible. Um, so, so the one that's closest is a young adult book called Kings of This World, and it's sort of thrillerish and um, n n naughty morally. You mm. know, kind of like oh, it's whether I can pull pull off the where it's going at the end is a good question. But um, and then I'm writing a memoir about that time that my mother had the the motor neurone disease. So I'm kind of writing about mostly about that but also having to explain a number of things about my childhood too so i never wanted to write a full memoir because uh, i don't think I, I i love my past and i love the people of my past but yeah i i don't know how much can ever be your examination but here i am doing this thing and also the other thing that i am going to finish but it has to be done with panache and flash and a whole lot of research is the last book in the Zass trilogy. So the Vintner's Luck is followed by The Angel's Cut. And so every 10 years, pretty much, I write another one. So the, then there'll be the last one called The Angel's Reserve. And I've got about a third of it written. So, yeah. And that's, it's, it's tricky. That's They're very, all tricky. Why is it all yeah. tricky? <laughs> uh, I mean, one might suggest one reason is that you're working on three books at once. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> all right. I we now have some questions. Thank you so much for everyone who's put questions in here. Um, I am going to ask you some of them. The first one, the, the fun one for sure, has the absolute book been optioned? And who would you choose to play Taryn? Oh, Hell's Bells. Yes. Well, mm. Oh, I look, well, I'm putting I you on the spot the when you say hell's No, no, I haven't even got to the point where I'm having fantasies about who would play Taryn. So, yeah, I can't can't answer that one. There have been inquiries, and, uh, well, we'll just wait and see. I don't see it as a film. I see it as television. It's way too much going on to be a <laughs> film. Uh, maybe the traditional Peter Jackson three movies at once model, if a film. <laughs> uh, that's a great non-answer that uh, really piques my curiosity even more. I'm assuming some huge announcement is coming down the pike and you can't convince me <laughs> otherwise. Um, yep, yep. All right, here's another question uh, from one of our viewers. Uh, I've noticed that many of your books have a character who loses their voice at some point and resorts to writing for communication. Is there a reason why this is a recurring theme? Well, I was doing it before my mother lost her voice and resorted to writing as communication which um, 
you know, I mean, it's it's watching someone lose the power to speak while retaining their mind is is interesting. It's 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 quite quite confronting in some ways, but also there there are things about it that are sort of wonderful, even if it's not wonderful for them. The way that you had these conversations where where you're slowed down, so that they have a long time to consider their answer because they're writing it and you have a long time to wait for their answer without interrupting. Um, and also it's very interesting watching the different ways in which people out in the world coped with my mother getting out her notebook. There'd be people who would just sort of shout at her as if she was deaf and, and she'd write, I'm not deaf, I can't speak. <laughs> and, and, and Or they'd immediately start talking to her as if some, you know, there was something wrong with her mind and there was nothing wrong with her mind. And then there were people who were so startled that they'd fall completely silent and then take her pad off her and answer her in writing. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, I mean, I, I, I'm sure I'm not done with characters who who write things down. Yeah, because, yeah. I, I, I'm, I guess this person's thinking of the very end of Wake, which is a book that needs to be published in the United States. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. I just, where? Yeah. All uh, right. Get Fergus to send me a copy. Um, <laughs> I, I love the idea of, of, uh, of writing in conversation as being the sort of slow conversation in the tradition of like the slow food movement. Like it just forces you to really consider what it is that you are conveying to the other person, whether it's worth the work that you of conveying it to the other person and it forces the other person to just be very present with you while you are you know painstakingly writing it down and delivering it to them in a way that often we aren't in conversations you can't just spend the whole conversation just thinking of what the next clever thing you're going to say is the way i so often do yes well that's right and and a mum could also because she was she was really um literate and so she, 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 she it was the force of the consideration and her things. But, but the thing was that she was also very private. So she used to tear up her notebooks, you know, sort of have this kind of, when she got to the end of a notebook, she'd tear them all up. So her side of all these conversations disappeared. Mm. So I have very few things. I mean, I do ha have, a, have a, a, a letter that she wrote to my son when he was behaving terribly, you know, during that time which I've never given to him because, you know, it's turned into, and here's your great dear grandmother t telling you off and this is your own bit of <laughs> communication. It's your legacy there. with her. <laughs> it's like, I've still got it, but yeah. yeah. Uh, just hearing that she tore all that stuff up is like killing the archivist in me. I'm just, I, I know just, it really, I, it's, I just finished <laughs> reading um, this enormous Hermione Lee biography of Tom Stopper that's being published and, and the holes in the book in places where uh, the letters weren't there anymore for some reason because his mother lost. I mean, a huge amount of the book is is basically told because he diligently wrote his mother two or three times a week for basically his entire life. And then the way the book transformed when his mother died and there were no longer those letters, uh, it just reminds me how hard it is to tell those stories when you don't have that kind of evidence. <laughs> it's actually quite interesting. That's 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 the biography, more or less, according to what it was I was able to tell my mother. Right, but all sort of all biographies are like that, and and a memoir where you're <laughs> depending on it in that way is basically the same way. It's what can you recapture, and it's, it's very dependent on physical media in a way that a lot of other writing still like isn't anymore. Um, this is a here's a question, another question from a viewer. Um, but it's going to lead to another question from me. It's about process. They want to know when you're when you're writing something this big, uh, how, or how are you not daunted? Are you an outliner, or do you just dive right in and you just sort of hope that you're going to figure out the next thing? I have scenes, and I have a kind of a atmosphere for the book, and I dive right in because I like to keep myself interested. But I've also got one of those brains that holds, you know large amounts of detail mm -hmm. like it's like <laughs> I can remember when I got to the end of writing Dream Hunter and Dreamquake which you know it's two books so it's a, it's more than the length of the absolute book altogether if you take the two books and um I I would wake up in the, in the middle of the night after finishing Dreamquake the second book panicking 
with this terrible feeling I'd mislaid something. This happened night after night for a while. And then in the end, I realized it was just this matrix kind of loosening in my head and falling <laughs> apart, you know, because it was, it was, I was able to. So I had this almost physical feeling of forgetting and dropping balls, but I was, I was allowed to drop the balls. So, uh, yeah. This is, that leads into another question from the chat. When that matrix sort of loosens, does all the stuff eventually disappear? Like, are those old books basically totally lost to you or, do, or does stuff stick? And what is the stuff that sticks? Oh, well, if I'm thinking of returning to them, like, you know, the Zass books, but they're mm -hmm. very episodic. So I, I, mean, I do have to keep track of stuff. But um, I mean, the thing is, you've written the book. So the only thing that you have to deal with is what your readers have already dealt with. So you can go back to it. Uh, what sticks? You're feeling about it, really. I mean, books in the end, they're like people. I mean, you remember the time you spent with them and you remember how you feel about them. Um, with, uh, wait, actually, we have another question from the chat. Sorry. Um, someone asks, this book and the Dream Hunter duet are very grounded in geography. Do maps come into play in your writing process? Sometimes, but not often. Um, I, the the maps were important in in the the world of Southland, like the Dream Hunter box and and um, Mortal Fire, because I'm intending to continue with that world. So I sort of really need to now that I know that I am, um, I really need to kind of keep the geography straight. I do, if I'm writing an action scene that's set in a building, do floor plan, plans sometimes. So there's a fire scene at the end of Dreamquake and the People's Palace in the middle of a debutante's ball. And I had to draw a floor map of several floors in order to kind of move my characters around. Uh, did you? Were you working off maps for the scene we were talking about in the absolute book and in the inlet with them shoving the tire around? No, because there's no inlet on that bit of coast in um, Norfolk that's that size. Because I could not get Wainui and Golden Wainui Inlet and Golden Bay out of my head. You know, right. basically, um, um, I was just sort of just go ahead and imagine it that way and see it that way, and then take out all references like to the way the sand looked that means that it's actually Wainui Inlet and not possibly somewhere on the Norfolk coast. So yeah, it's just will, a fake out. <laughs> I will say that New Zealand is the place where I have most vividly experienced uh, the tides uh, ruining my day. So I, even though I knew it was supposed to be in Norfolk, I also envisioned it in New Zealand. Um, all right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm so glad that I got to chat with you and I'm so glad that we thank have you, so, many, so many enthusiastic watchers and commenters and questioners. Uh, the book is the absolute book. I believe our fine hosts at the Strand are going to come back and tell you all how you can buy this sucker, which you should absolutely do. Um, I love it. And I'm so happy that it's out in the United States. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Thank you again for joining us. Um, if, if our audience has not already purchased a copy, there is a handy button at the bottom of your screen where it says purchase the absolute book. Click on that. You can buy it, read it for yourself, learn essentially what we've been talking about all night um thank you both of you for joining us tonight is there anything you'd like to say to our audience before we sign off for the night uh thanks and yes please buy this book from the strand or or another independent bookstore for goodness sakes thank you for tuning in and um yeah have a great evening and thank you dan thank you thank Elizabeth. you sophie <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Stay safe out there and have a good rest of your night.